You've been a neurologist for nearly 30 years. Can you tell us about your experience in training? Did you have any type of exposure or training in neurofeedback? After training in medical school, I did an internship and residency in pediatrics, and then went on and did a fellowship, additional training in the field of neurology and neurophysiology. In the current, what I consider evidence-based understanding of neurofeedback and neuromodulation, training was zero, about like the kind of training we received for nutrition, approach to a healthy life, not much at all. So all of that just happened over the last five, six years. Yes, I've been, I was faculty at the Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, for about 17 years. And my specialty has been in the area of pediatric epilepsy or working with children and their families where their major symptoms relate to seizures, recurrent seizures and all the devastation and complication that that can entail. In most places in the world with training, it's a very standardized so-called allopathic type of treating the symptoms. In our country, that's primarily related to using medications, which is the majority of time, occasionally using surgical procedures of the brain or some related systems to try to help people with seizures. And that's the mainstay. That's considered the, the norm around the world. How did you get interested in treating epilepsy? Seizures have always impacted me because they, to our awareness, they strike without warning. I heard a quote years ago for a person living with seizures. It's like walking on a stage full of trap doors and you never know at what instant one of those trap doors will open up and you'll fall through. They are, so we talk about seizures being unpredictable. Well, they're not. They're unpredictable to us. They're obviously predictable phenomenon if we knew what we were doing. Animals are often smarter than we are, and they know how to predict detect seizures. You taught conventional treatment options at the medical school in South Carolina and elsewhere, including medications and surgery. Did you feel that was enough for what you wanted to do with your seizure patients? No. And that wasn't unique to MUSC here in Charleston or in Nebraska where I trained or in Virginia where I worked for quite a few years and did additional training. Our general approach, I believe, in healthcare today is trying to manage symptoms. We come with symptoms and so we try to suppress those symptoms. In people with seizures or persons with epilepsy around the world and Estimates are about 65 to 70 million people worldwide with epilepsy. The current quoted numbers are about a third of the time we, they have no ability to completely control seizures. And that's a lot of people. In South Carolina alone, there's about 65 or 70,000 people with seizures. That's a lot of people. But it seems sometimes like we're not always healthcare providers, we're just disease managers. We're straightening deck chairs on the Titanic, we're putting out fires, and there's a lot of fires to put out, and that keeps us so busy and so distracted instead of finding out why are all the fires popping up all over the place. There are persons out there who may have a seizure, pretty easy to understand, to diagnose, they may go on a medication, and sort of live happily ever after, where the medicine seems to do its job, they don't experience side effects, and that's wonderful when that happens. It just didn't seem all that common to me. So the people that I was involved with and still am are the, the people and the families where those seizures aren't controlled. One medicine doesn't do it. And then the typical approach is try a second medicine or a third medicine. So many people end up on multiple medications. And it's great when that works. But for the most part, we're just trying to 
quiet the brain to stop having seizures, but we're not still getting at the underlying causes of what's causing those seizures. How do you go from teaching in that environment and practicing with a traditional model that most neurologists practice with to finding out about neurofeedback? I think the role now of neurofeedback and neuromodulation are huge. That took a while to get there. Through the years, understanding the limitations of medications, understanding the implications and sometimes limitations of surgery, the, my emphasis was always trying to look for other things that would help people do better from a standpoint of seizures. Look at, helping them to look at their lifestyle, to look at triggers with sleep and how healthy they were and what was going on in their nutritional world, what they were eating. And you referred a little while ago to neurofeedback. I had heard like maybe like many physicians through training or through a career, I've heard of neurofeedback as something those other people do. Most things outside the traditional medication, surgical options become what's called alternative modalities, alternative therapies. Then NIH, National Institutes of Health, has a complementary and alternative modality unit. It's huge. People understand that in the world today, medications and surgery are just a small part of options that should be available to everybody for their health care. Unfortunately, sometimes that term alternative carries a little stigma or alternative means it's not evidence-based. Cumulatively, over the last years, I started hearing more about neurofeedback from different colleagues around the world. Some neurologists, not many, uh, but other esteemed colleagues like yourself, neuropsychologists, clinicians, people involved in healthcare who were looking at other ways of getting people healthier. I've always had a drive to, to look for other things since medications and surgeries often did not provide the solution. They didn't provide the cure. They didn't provide the complete seizure freedom or other symptoms that people struggle with that involve our nervous systems. Hearing the word neurofeedback through the years, uh, finally running into people I trust, I decided to look more into it. I went in kind of the side door with that by uh, learning more about something called quantitative EEG. EEG is something we as neurologists and epileptologists have used for years. It's been available for almost 100 years after it was discovered back in the uh, 1920s. And the EEG is the ability, it stands for electroencephalography. It's the electrical activity or the electric, electromagnetic activity of the brain. Because our brains are going, they're working all the time, day and night. How did I get here? I've always had a passion, maybe a desperation for all of those people, all of those kids where a simple medication didn't fix everything or give the appearance of fixing everything. And when it comes to people with seizures and epilepsy, that's pretty devastating. Even one seizure every year is pretty impacting, especially when there's often an inability to predict when that's going to strike, when that's going to hit. And uh, the implications of that are huge. Being able to offer neuromodulation, neurofeedback as part of the overall healthcare has been transforming to watch many people's lives change and no longer be patients because they get better with symptoms. How did you end up taking the jump into using a tool like neurofeedback that can help change the brain? One long part of that journey into other aspects of healthy brains was the research I've done over the last 18 years on music and the brain, so called the, what I call the nonlinear effects of music, not just music therapy, which is important, but how music changes our brains structurally, electrophysiologically, 
And that's been known for, oh, a few thousand years, but the science behind it now. So that led to additional training where I, while working full time at MUSC, did additional training in clinical research and epidemiology and biostatistics so I could conduct clinical trials to help, which is where you take up some type of an intervention and work with people in a study situation to see if this intervention helps them. And so I did that training and then conducted several clinical trials working with some colleagues in Irvine, California and elsewhere and found that music in some particular forms and delivery systems helped change the brain and particularly help people with seizures and epilepsy. All of them, no, but a good pro proportion of them, especially the people where medicines weren't helping and surgeries may have already not accomplished what they wanted. And so that was again, a step into what may be considered alternative therapies, but nonetheless, it was evidence-based, it was brain-based. So that continued a couple decades of work of looking for brain-based therapies, brain-based treatments to help people. And that just doesn't apply to people with seizures. That applies to kind of anything that involves our brains in the field of neurology and the field of psychiatry, because our brains kind of have a big influence on kind of everything in our lives. Um, and then it's sort of having some of those duh moments that I have a lot of in my life was like, if our bodies can get healthier from changing what we do, exercising, eating better, managing stress, sleeping better, why not our brains? And at least for me, that seems like a pretty obvious correlation with our brains. We know now scientifically over the last 20 years with the discovery of neuroplasticity that our brains can always change no matter how old we are. So when you're talking about neuroplasticity and how music affects the brain, how's music like neurofeedback? How did that transition happen? Those clinical trials that we did in collaboration with my colleagues in Irvine and a couple other centers, I saw improvements, but it wasn't always as robust, the term. It wasn't as dramatic as I would want. We would see some substantial changes, but I knew there had to be more. And I started hearing from colleagues who had been using neurofeedback for decades, colleagues that I trusted, that were well-respected, and that led me to look into what is this neurofeedback thing. In healthcare, I've heard about that a lot through the years. We hear of neurofeedback, again, as one of those foo-foo things that people do, whatever. And I'm always looking for another reason to learn something new. My paradigm was if neurofeedback is what these people are saying, and it's been around since the 50s, 60s, why is it not being used? And if it's not real, I wanted to find out why, and let's quit talking about it. That led me down the rabbit hole um, to an unbelievable expansion of what I call waking up from the matrix. For those of you who have seen the original matrix movie, it was realizing there's a whole world that I, we weren't, we're not even aware of. I was not aware of. So about five or six years ago, I went on a quest to learn more about it. Again, while working full time, went to a course in what's called QEG, understanding EEG and the quantitative analysis, how to understand what those waveforms mean. And that's been around a long time. And that led me to a meeting where I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Barry Sturman, one of the founders of the field of neurofeedback, and Dr. Jill Lubar, and Jay Gunkelman, and a couple other colleagues. Then I read this simple little book, masterfully put together, called A Symphony in the Brain 
by Jim Robbins, which he published first in, I think, 2001, and then did another edition in 2008. And that book was huge for me. It's not sold in medical school textbook or, or bookstores, but he did his homework very carefully. And I encourage a lot of families to read that. And when I kind of can tell, it's almost a litmus test. When somebody's read that, they come back angry, like, what is this? This has been around 50 years. Why have we never heard that in 2012, the Practice Wise Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics gave level one evidence, the highest level of evidence to neurofeedback for ADD and ADHD eight years ago? Why is that not around? I don't know. So was it research and reading that actually prompted you to start including neurofeedback for patients? The first influence was colleagues that I trusted that used this as part of their practice. The second came during the time I devoted to training in neurofeedback and quantitative EEG and other forms of neuromodulation. And then now for the last almost five years in our practice where we, I have the privilege of seeing um, a lot of a lot of people. I have used the phrase many times. That I feel more and more now like a healthcare provider than ever before in my career, and seeing changes I, I, has been astounding. What do people notice? When, they, when you start adding neurofeedback to their treatment? What people start experiencing when they receive neurofeedback, in my experience in our practice, is they experience change. It, to me, it takes an experience to change an experience. Many people, when they come here, are tired, frustrated, have tried many, many different medications for many, many different symptoms. And more and more people are coming because they don't want to go a medication route for some type of symptom first, because they know for the most part, medications are simply trying to treat a symptom, much like we're trying to use uh, acetaminophen, an anti-fever medicine to treat a fever instead of getting at the root of the fever. So when I talk to colleagues, talk to their patients or clients, when I went through the sabbatical and worked and trained with people and saw people's lives change, that was enough for me. I initially had hoped to do it in the context of my clinical academic research position. That didn't work. There's not, um, it just, it didn't work for various reasons. There are a couple colleagues now, neurologists and epileptologists around the world that are beginning to establish some groundwork doing that in an academic setting. Uh, nonetheless, this is where I am. 